The United States is the only country in human history that has exited every decade in a stronger military and economic position than it entered it. And we've been doing that now for 14 consecutive decades. The Chinese have done that for three. The Brits during the period of empire did it for six. 14. We need to understand why. It's this map. At the center of the map, you'll see the interconnected waterways of the greater Mississippi. And off the coast, you've got the intercoastal waterway. Put together, that's about 15,000 miles of interconnected waterway. Now, why is that important? Two things. One, moving stuff from A to B is a bit of a bitch. But moving it by water is actually pretty easy. In terms of locomotion costs, it's 1 15th the cost. Once you add in everything from the taxes that go into the infrastructure, it's about 1 50th to 1 70th the cost based on where you are. The United States has 15,000 miles in one system. The rest of the world combined has 13,000 miles. So it doesn't matter if we elect a monkey, we're going to be okay because we have this as an advantage and it overlays the greatest chunk of arable land on the planet. We are always going to be capital rich as a result because it's just cheaper for us to move things from A to B. Second, we are the only country on the planet that has a spatial orientation that allows us to have a major population on both trading basins. So when the Asians are in recession, we can trade with the Europeans. When the Europeans are in recession, we can trade with the Asians. When we're in recession, we export it to the world because we're just that kind of people. That's not really a joke. Every recession we've had since 1945 has gone global. We have yet to import one. As a side effect of this, we have the world's most unified financial space because if you're on that network, it doesn't really matter if you're in Minnesota and you're borrowing from a Georgia bank. You're all literally in the same boat from the network. We identify with each other. We have the largest projection-based military in the world because we have oceans protecting us on both sides, vast open spaces to the north and the south. So when we build a military, it's not to defend a border. It's to project. We keep problems away from our shores. And as a side effect, we have the largest consumer market in the world. If you take nothing else away from this presentation, remember this. You're going to be fine. <laughs> Let's talk about why you're not feeling very good. Back in what we Americans think of as the ancient part of history, the world was imperial. The French Navy protected French trade between the French mainland and the French colonies. The British Navy did the same, and so on. It was a series of sequestered imperial economic and military systems. You didn't want to trade with your immediate neighbor because if you did and you went to war with them next Tuesday, that trade would disappear and your economy would immediately fall into depression. So you set up your own system and you enforced it with your own weapons. This led to ultimately World War II. At the end of World War II, the Americans said, you know, we're going to cut that shit out. And we created a fundamentally new economic structure called Bretton Woods. What it did is it said everyone can trade with everyone else. We will open our market, the largest market in history, and the only really one to survive the war, and we will absorb anything you can export. We will use our navy to guarantee freedom of the seas, to make sure that no one, pirates, Russians, Germans, Brits, French, anybody, can interfere with the trade between any two nations, even if we're not involved. This is the foundation of the modern world. This set up, among other things, our trade deficit. This was designed. We did this to ourselves on purpose. How were we able to enforce it? Well, pretty straightforward. <laughs> the one on the left, that's a supercarrier. The one on the right is a traditional jump carrier. There are about 10 jump carriers in the world. None of them are American. There are 10 supercarriers in the world. They're all American, and each one has five to seven times the firepower of the little guys. If you were to sail the entire combined blue water fleet of the world against the United States, two of these could end it in about six hours. The United States has more projection tonnage than the rest of the world combined by a factor of three. This is how we forced a new economic system on the world. We did it to fight the Cold War. We used our economy to underwrite everybody else into an alliance that we basically bribed. And it worked fantastically. You may have noticed the Cold War ended 25 years ago. We've been coasting since then, and the American commitment to the free trade order has been dropping bit by bit by bit. Whether it happens in one day of anger or a decade of neglect, we are moving away from this model. Fun thing is, 
We never bet our system on it in the first place. For us, it was a strategic gambit, not an economic one. As a percentage of GDP, there are only three countries on this planet that are less integrated to the wider world than we are. Brazil, Rwanda, and South Sudan. 14% of our GDP is from exports. One third of that is oil. Guess what shale's doing to that? Of the remainder, two thirds of our trade portfolio is in the Western Hemisphere. Half of it is just with NAFTA. The United States is an isolated economy and the biggest economy and the most secure economy. Let's talk demography. You can split any population into three general categories. First, you have your young workers, people roughly aged 20 to 45. These are the folks that are having kids, going to college, buying cars, buying homes. They're big spenders. This is mo where most of the growth in a consumer-led economy comes from. However, they're at the beginning of their system. So they don't have a lot of money, so they have to borrow to fund all of this stuff. Second, you've got your mature workers, people roughly 40 to 65. The kids are mostly moved out, the house is mostly paid for, they're at the top of their earning experience. But they don't have a lot of debt, they don't have a lot of consumption, so this is where the investment in the system comes from. And normally it's a strict system, small generation providing credit to a larger generation. Things like business plans matter, collateral matters. And finally, you have your retirees. They've made their nest egg, they take it away, they put it in cash, generate sorts of investment that don't generate much of an income and also don't generate a lot of economic growth. Here's Canada. Do we have any Canadians in the room? It's got to be at least, there we go. What is wrong with you people? About 1965, you forgot how to have kids. <laughs> Look at that. No replacement generation coming up. You've got a big bulge of mature workers. And you know, I spent some quality years in Canada when I was a kid and I can tell you, you got the basics down. You're just missing something. So right now, Canada is the most capital rich it has ever been. Interest rates are at the floor, you can buy a house for pennies on the dollar once you figure in the interest costs. It's a great time to be up there. The Alberta oil boom, for example, was funded because of this demographic. But you fast forward a few years, and that bulge moves into retirement, and there isn't a replacement generation to pay taxes, or one behind that to generate growth. So Canada is in the equivalent of going up a cliff and it's about to jump off from a financial point of view. Here's the United States. Let's start with the boomers. Who are the folks in the room who were born between 1945 and 1965? Hands up. Okay, quite a few boomers. The current world, if you want to blame someone for it, blame them. <laughs> Medicare, Monica Lewinsky, subprime, these are all their fault. Let's start with the more serious of those, subprime. Boomers are the largest generation as a percentage of the population in American history. As such, they swarmed in hordes into the labor market when they hit age 20 to 25. They competed with each other for such, so it was such anger that they drove prices down for labor across the board. That's why so many of them are two-income homes, because they had to be. Play that forward to where they are right now at the mature level, where they're paying in taxes in mass and they're nearing retirement, and they have the same problem. They're competing for investment opportunities. And so they're pushing money into anything that they think might eke out another percent or two of returns. And this is where subprime comes from. This is where the developing world boom of the last 15 years comes from. It's boomer money looking to make a little bit more before they retire. Gen Y. These are people born 1980 to 1999. All right, you guys are the second largest generation as a percentage of the population in American history. You're the boomers' kids writ large. You are the best educated population that we've ever had. However, you face the same existential crisis as your parents. There's too many of you. And you're competing for jobs just like your parents did, which is driving down your earning potential, which means you still live at home. And then Gen X, people born 1966 roughly to 1980. Okay, we're the smallest generation, I'm in that group, right in the middle. We're the smallest generation ever in this country. And when we came into the workforce, there were so many boomers that we didn't hardly earn anything. We are the internal intern generation. <laughs> now, as the boomers retire, we're both middle and upper management from a small pool. And so what we've seen among Gen X 
is much higher rates of family formation in our early years because we had to to get by, but much higher incomes and more stable families as we get older because the retiring boomers are leaving this huge space open for us. The downside we've discovered is that Gen Y will never vote for Social Security or Medicare reform because if they do that, their parents move in with them. <laughs> so something the boomers and Gen Y agree upon is that X should pay for everything. <laughs> Here's the United States versus the rest of the developing world, and you can see that the developing world writ large has roughly the same problem that the Canadians do. But check this out, 15 years from now, when Gen Y matures, and I use that in the loosest possible way, <laughs> they will eventually be able to reach that mature worker area, they will fill out the growth profile, and the budget battles that we see right now will finally end. Now, it'll take 15 years. We've got 15 more years of this crap. This, if it, but look at this. The developed world. What the hell happened? And this, this, this is actually the good picture, because this has US data in it. Let's remove the US. The rest of the developed world becomes an old folks' home. They're not going to buy a lot of American crap or anybody else's crap. But wow, healthcare, that'll be big. A few specific examples. Japan is the fastest, and old, fastest aging and oldest economy in the world. Uh, their consumption boom is completely over. Italy is past the point of demographic recovery. It will have ever-shrinking populations. And because they don't have anybody in this block, they're all up here and getting older, consumption-led growth can never happen in Italy ever again. So the European financial crisis, it's as good as it's going to be right now. And it's only going to last for 10 years because Germany has a similar problem, but they're even older. So right now, Germany can afford the bailouts. They've got a big chunk of people with that tax paying pop, kind of like where our boomers are. But when they retire, Germany can't afford it anymore. So Europe has about 10 years to figure out how to deal with no positive economic growth ever again. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> People think China is a superpower. Sorry, one child policy. That spike of the 25 to 30 somethings, that one chunk is the entirety of the Chinese consumption boom. And in five years, it'll be over. And if the Chinese want to replace that generation, if they start right now, and I mean like go out in the lobby and get to it, <laughs> It will be 25 years before the new generation can actually replace the consumption. Because you can't just pop out a 25-year-old. Does this mean that there are no problems, that the United States doesn't have any challenges as to power to security and wealth? No, that's not what it means. It does mean that structurally we're in a great spot, and no matter how hard we try, we really can't screw it up. We can always do better. But let's talk about the biggest challenge, and that's energy. This is the world at night. This is where the people with money live, because they can afford to have lights. Here's where the world's conventional oil and natural gas is. Watch Arabia and North America. Here's where the shale is. Sometimes it's really that simple. In the process of producing the 7 million barrels of crude, shale crude that we are right now, we have cut global energy consumption by almost a half a million barrels per day simply because we don't have to ship it from halfway around the world. We don't have to worry about security issues, we don't have to worry about supply issues, and it's generated probably about 400,000 direct and indirect jobs already. 